Welcome everyone to the public talk in the topic of why we post and the anthropology of social media. This talk is arranged by the small but high quality group of the bachelor from the Faculty of Sociology and Anthropology at Tongsat University. Um, I'm actually from the Faculty of Communication Arts at Jilangkong University. I'm just a little bit proud of it, just become the MC here. Um, and, okay. and they actually, the group of lecturers from Tongsat University try to arrange this kind of like, you know, public talk and do some activities related social media to the anthropologies. And I think they're one of the most active group who are doing this right now. Um, and of course, they, they done the project last year. I joined them in Content University. And this year, of course, they tried to arrange something and brought some knowledge to Thai society. This talk is actually um, new talking about why we post and related the topic to the anthropology subject. And for this year, we have the very distinguished guest lecturer. He coming to talk to us about the, his research. And his research is doing, it's about 15 months, and um, you know, send a lot of people all around the world to observe how people use the social media and how it's impact to their life. And the thing is, uh, the professor who coming to talk to us today, he read a lot of, he, he, he written a lot of book, uh, and one of the famous book is uh, talking about, it's the topic and the title is The Tale from Facebook. And this book has been revealed a lot in the YouTube channel. And uh, he also written about uh, social media in an English village. And the book title, How the World Shares Social Media, Visualizing Facebook, Holy Media. So I guess that this is really tell you how he focusing on the social media and anthropology, and maybe he is the kind of like one of the most famous lit scholars who doing this research. So please, everyone, please welcome Professor Daniel Miro. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm very grateful to the Faculty of Sociology and Anthropology at Tomasat uh, University for the invitation. I'm very grateful to the uh, sponsors you just heard from, who will make sure that there is a, uh, a full uh, university course based on this work that will be available free and in Thai, um, as you said, later this year. Now, why? why? Why would we do this work? Actually, I think it's very obvious because you know that people make claims about social media in the newspapers and discussing it with each other pretty much every day and, and very general claims. So they'll tell you things like, oh, you know, our brain's capacity is shrinking because of social media or young people today, they don't really know what a proper friend is um, because of social media, or politics is now more divisive because of social media. Everybody makes these claims. Now, we work as anthropologists, and we listen to these things, and we say, but wait a minute. Um, so when you say these things, you're talking about farmers in India, right? Because they use social media. You're talking about uh, factory workers in China, are you? Because they use social media. Who are you talking about? So in order to really respond to these simple generalizations, we felt we need to do some work. And what we organized was a team of nine anthropologists, and we all committed that we would go simultaneously and we would work for 15 months in different sites around the world. And very briefly, the places we worked were as follows. We worked, I worked in England. We had somebody working in, in the boot of Italy. Um, we have somebody on the border between Syria and Turkey in a place called Mardin. We have somebody in Trinidad. We have somebody looking at copper miners in the north of Chile. We have somebody in a very kind of low-income area behind the coast in Brazil. 
Um, we had somebody who worked in a place where there were many professional IT workers, but in the midst of villagers, so you could look at the villagers and the IT workers in India. And we also have um, two sites in China. One, actually, the uh, Xinyuan lived inside one of these factories, and another person in a rural town. So the point really is to try and work out how people actually use these things. And in a way, anthropology, we would argue, is the most natural way of undertaking this kind of study. Why? Because although when you talk about the new digital world, you think, oh, the data scientists, the computer specialists, but their interest tends to be in publicly available data, like Twitter data, um, or in the technology. Whereas social media is social. A lot of it consists of the very private, personal things that people post every day on their ordinary accounts. And actually, if you want to see that, you can't take it off as data. You actually have to know the people well, and they have to trust you, so they actually will show you these very ordinary family engagements that take place. And the other point about anthropology is we start with the premise that we don't know why people post. I don't know if the most important thing is going to be to do with their education, or their work, or their family, or their religion. So we take a very holistic approach in which we try and look at all of these things and then make a judgment as to actually which do seem to be more important in understanding the particular thing we're interested in. Now, you might think that if you have nine different sites around the world, the one advantage is that you can do things like this. You can start making counts and compare them across the nine sites. Um, we do that. Of course, it's not really representing Brazil. It's one tiny place that the person would have worked in in Brazil. Um, but we are a bit suspicious about this kind of quantitative approach, partly because we feel that people actually understand the questions differently in each site. But at least what this does is it shows you that social media is not just one thing that you have to understand it in respect to these different populations and the differences between them. So, having done that, we, we, okay, um, this is really, therefore, not what we do very much. Instead, our technique, our method, is what we call ethnography. And because I know that many people in this audience are not anthropologists and haven't come across ethnography, I'm going to spend five minutes telling you a little bit about it. Actually, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to show you a little film. Because one of the people in the team, her name was Qin Yuan Wang, she was the one who lived in the factory in China, but she's also a very good artist uh, in traditional like calligraphy and Chinese arts. And she, um, yeah, she produced a, a kind of five-minute summary, which is really trying to give you a sense of what does it feel like to do this kind of work where you're trying to get the trust of people and you're trying to make sense of where social media fits into their life. It seems we can get this short film um, from YouTube, hopefully. And um, I think it's interesting, hopefully, for you to watch, especially for people who have never come across ethnography and want to just get a feel for how, you know, we've given all the results, but how do you get this information? How do you do this work? The only thing I would suggest is maybe people at the back would like to come a bit more forward in order to see the screen better. You don't have to, but it's a, a suggestion because obviously the screen is quite far away. Okay? So. All right. Should I play it? Yes. I can I can play it.
Okay, so um, that's a five minute guide to how it feels to do ethnography and how it's a little different from most other methodologies. If you found it difficult to um, see, it's available on YouTube. Um, it's just called The Field Note and it's by uh, Xinyu and Wang. And um, actually why we post, as I said, we have about 130 films. So um, if you would like to watch the other films, there's plenty there from the different countries. Um, in a way, I'm going to then call, you're simply going to have to assume a bit more about the nature of ethnography. But what she actually showed was the way that she sort of comes out of a university, she moves and lives inside this factory. Um, it's important because I say a factory, but actually 250 million people have moved in China from rural areas into the factory system. And we really don't know that much about their lives. So by spending 15 months actually living inside the factory, she's able to get a sense um, of what these people do and, I, and the place of social media, which I will come back to. Um, but the point is that we have nine studies, not just one. And the way we worked is at the end of each month, we would compare our results with respect to any particular topic. So, for example, at the end of one month, um, the person who is working in Brazil uh, says, oh, you want to know why people post certain photographs, right? So, obviously, this is a very uh, low income. It's, it's an area of poverty. So, people are not going to post by the houses, which are only half built, and the kind of conditions that they really live in. They're going to post oh, I'm, um, I'm in the gym, I'm next to the swimming pool. They're going to post things that demonstrate their aspirations um, on social media. So he writes about that from Brazil. But at the same time, the person who's working in northern Chile says, what are you talking about? I also work in this very low-income area, right? But the people where I work, they know each other well. They, you can't post something that isn't true. Everybody knows it's not true. So how would you post those kind of things? Where I am, everybody posts just very kind of ordinary images, unpretentious images, so these are the Chilean ones, um, of everyday life. And the point I'm making is that you get two totally different conclusions from each site, and that means that the people have to explain why in one site they post about aspirations and the other site they post how they actually live. And this happens again and again. So I'm working in England and everybody is telling me, oh, social media is terrible because it's destroying our privacy, right? We no longer have privacy in the way we used to have it. And then the person in China, I don't think you could read it from here, um, she's giving a story. She's saying a 17-year-old comes from a rural area. She didn't have privacy. People didn't knock on doors. They live in dormitories, right? They, for her, like this life of privacy, is, it's like some new modern idea. And actually, the first time she really gets to experience it in the way she's heard about on television is in social media. So for the English, it's the death of privacy. And for these Chinese workers, it's the birth of privacy. And that's what happens every single time. You get specific differences. And mostly, our expectations were wrong. So you go somewhere on the border of Syria and Turkey, and you think it's all going to be about politics, um, because there's a Kurdish community and an Arab community and a Turkish community, and there's an awful lot of politics going on. Actually, though, what we find is no. Social media is social. It's where your family and your friends are. You don't want to put all this divisive stuff on social media. The big consequences in that area was not politics, it was gender. Why? Because this was a traditional Islamic society where there is strong restrictions on young people. And with social media, it's the very first time that a young woman can be sending 500 messages a day to her secret boyfriend without the parents knowing anything about it. And that is a major change in a society like that. Equally, if you ask, how important is social media? What, what difference does it make in a society? It depends where you are. In our site in southern Italy, right, 
People are very sociable. They go out in the evening, they walk around the town, they have a drink with their friends, and generally speaking, they would say, yeah, we have social media, but it's not changed things any great deal, right? Um, on the other hand, the film you didn't see as there was based on this factory. Now, what Xin Yun Wang argues for these factory workers is that actually there's two migrations going on of 250 million people. They're moving from rural area to factory area and they're moving from offline to online. And the interesting thing is the one that brings them closer to the kind of modern China they were heading for is not the move to the factory, it's the move to online. Because again, she was wrong. She thought they would be using this to contact their families back in the rural areas they came from, but by and large they're not. They're not making friendships with their fellow workers very much because they move from factory to factory. Um, actually, their life, the real one they really care about, is now this online life. That's where they're making their friends, that's where they're creating their idea of, of, of a modern life. Because they live in places like this, but they can fantasize being princesses and they can accumulate all the kind of objects and things they would associate. Um, and given that most of the time they're either working, sleeping or eating, but outside of that they're spending all their time on social media. So the place you could say they live is not these places that they sleep in, but these places where they spend all their time in. So, whereas in Italy, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference, for these factory workers in China, it's completely transformative of even where they live and you could say who they are. So, the point I've been making so far is that in each place, social media is turned into something different. And that's why the main book that comes out of this project is not called How Does Social Media Change the World? It's called, How Does the World Change Social Media? Because you have to do the study in your site. I would say the weirdest, the strangest population that we came across in these nine, at least to me, was a group of people we call the English, right? Now, why are these English so strange? How, because how do they use social media? What we found is that in England, when adults start using social media, uh, they have a, a, what we call a myth of community. They, they believe that once upon a time they lived in real communities, which various ways you can say is not necessarily the case, but they believe it. So along comes Facebook and Friends Reunited, and they connect back with the people they used to be at school with, or the cousins that live in the north, um, etc. Then after about two months, they remember why they cut off from the people they used to be at school with, right? Um, and actually, what they then do is they use social media in a very English way. It relates to what we call the net curtains in the house, where you can observe, but not necessarily be so observed. They, they keep people at just a distance in social media. So, you know, you went on holiday, you got to know somebody maybe a bit better than you should have done. Um, you don't want to dump them altogether, um, but you kind of don't want to see them again. So they're on Facebook, that's fine, they're on Facebook. All those other people, because they're on Facebook, you don't have to invite them into your house, you don't have to have a long telephone call with them, they're, but you haven't cut them off completely. This kind of in-between grey area is what English people like to use social media for. Now it's not that you don't find that in all the sites, but when we compare, we find it much more common in the English setting because it's a very English way of doing social relations. Now, having said about all these differences, of course, there are also general transformations that take place with social media. One of the important ones is with respect to communication. And I think you can say that traditionally we've had two main forms of communication. We've had oral communication, we've had textual communication. But now we use visuals in more like a everyday communicative form, right? We always use visuals to communicate, but not quite in that way. Because the point about something like Snapchat 
is people soon realized, based on things like uh, images and emoticons and so forth, that you can use your face to tell your friends how you are feeling every 10 minutes throughout the course of the day, right? And it becomes a much more conversational set of relationship as a visual form. Gradually, therefore, the visuals online start to transform. So when Facebook first comes on, the visuals are more like traditional analog photographs. You sort of put it into albums. Um, and people said, oh, Facebook is like self-expression. But even then, it wasn't so simple. Because you remember on Facebook, there were two ways you can see people, right? You can look at the photos that they have posted, and you can look at the photos they've been tagged in by other people. Now, which ones do you tend to look at? Um, the ones they post for themselves tend to be a little bit more kind of boring. So here's somebody, he's posting his, um, these are the ones he posted, and those are the ones somebody posted of him, right? So I'll move on. Um, clearly, you tend to look at the ones that have been tagged because they're more revealing. So instead of being self-expression, it's like somebody else dresses you to go out into the world. Um, it's a strange relationship. And gradually, new genres and norms develop around these visual postings. So I'm not sure exactly why English school children feel that every time you point your phone at them, they either have to stick out their tongue or they have to go like this, but they do hundreds and thousands of times, as I see when I'm going through their profiles. And so you can see things like the, the norm of how you appear to be spontaneous is actually a norm that progresses um, as these media develop. You also realize that each platform starts to develop its own particular kind of visuals. So those were Facebook. Um, Twitter is where English especially young people, like to insult each other. And basically, you don't post visuals on Twitter unless either it's quite clever or it's quite funny. And those become the Twitter visuals. Um, by contrast, most of you would recognize that these are Instagram images, right? Because these are the ones where, oh, you've gone out and you've taken this nice picture and you've added the filter and you want it to look kind of quite pretty, etc., on Instagram. And, you know, of all your holiday pictures, it's the, it's the special ones that might get posted on Instagram. Um, these will be English Instagram posts, and you get the theme, right? Um, even there, there are quite interesting differences in aesthetics. Um, so, uh, people that are perhaps slightly less educated will tend to post things that are evidently good-looking. Whereas the ones at the kind of top of the educational ladder are going to, again, post kind of clever images. Oh, you know, sunburn can look interesting, right? Um, if you're the right kind of person and you're impressing your mates um, with that particular kind of aesthetic. Um, Snapchat also has its own particular kind of visual genres, but I will move on quickly from that one. Um, and across the platforms, there are also the genres that people are fascinated by. I cannot tell you what proportion of journalists, when they're coming to ask me about the project, want to ask about selfies. So I realize I cannot avoid the topic. What we find is that the problem is that the word selfie is maybe a bit too close to the English selfish. So everyone says, oh, young people are narcissistic. You know, they're all selfish today because of what they post. But if you take this seriously and you look, you find there are many different genres of selfie. Sure, there's the, the glamour one that you might put on your Instagram account. But when I was working with um, school kids, I found that when you want a selfie, actually what they usually do is they put their arms around each other. This is uh, best friend forever, besties, you know? <laughs> Um, so that's not individual. That's all about showing little friendship groups. And actually the most common kind of selfie is the one down here, an ugly. Um, if you want to be ugly, the best thing is put the phone under your chin and have it pointed upwards, right? That's about as ugly as you can be. 
Why is that the most common one? Because on Snapchat, they basically are showing this picture to their friends and saying to their friends, OK, I trust you not to show this to anybody outside of my friendship group because it's about building trust. Um, so if you take selfies seriously, you can actually find quite serious selfies. While I was doing this work, I was also spending one day a week um, working on the issue of new media for a hospice. Now, a hospice is a place that is where people go, um, usually with cancer, but or with some other condition um, when it's been diagnosed as terminal. They are probably not going to recover from this illness. Um, and the hospice was interested in the implications of looking at new media, so I was working with the patients to, to make a, a report on this to help them develop their use of these technologies. Now, this was Matt, um, and Matt, who used to work in IT, um, was talking to me about his use of Facebook. And he would say, Danny, the thing is that, actually, um, one good thing about Facebook is when you have cancer and the disease progresses or you have chemotherapy, instead of having to tell each person individually about what's been happening, I can tell everybody at the same time. But you know, there's another thing here, which is when I come to post on Facebook, it's like I then sort of have to acknowledge to myself what has been happening to me, to myself. And I noticed that at that time, he put as his cover picture, not just a selfie, but a very particular kind of selfie, what we call a mirror selfie. And actually, it's an exquisitely precise use of technology to express visually exactly what I have just said. That he, in this case, he was coming out of chemotherapy, ready to face people again, and he was not only showing other people that, he was showing them that he was also showing it to himself at the same time. So this is what I mean by saying, instead of just dismissing the selfie as selfish, actually take these things seriously. It's a visual genre that needs analysis, and you will find really interesting things going on with it. Same would be true of things like the meme. Now, the meme pretty much didn't exist before social media, and yet today, it proliferates. There are memes all over the place. But what are they doing there? Why are they there? Now, we do an analysis of memes, and we find, firstly, there are, again, different genres and kinds of meme. But we also reach a conclusion. We call memes the moral police of the internet. Now, what we mean by that is this, that one of the things that's fascinating for anthropologists is, you know, we used to work in societies where to explain um, why people thought this was appropriate or this was bad behaviour comes from traditions. And yet, online, within months, if not weeks, everyone seems to know this is OK to post, this is not OK to post. How do they know that? Point about memes is that they tend to be about values, moral values, like, oh, this is what's wrong with men. This is what's wrong with politicians. These are the faiths you should believe in, right? And we find that a lot of people we work with who are not necessarily very literate, not necessarily very confident, but they find it easy to share these memes. So in a way, they are able to share very quickly and very comprehensively a statement about the moral values they support and the ones that they don't support. And as I said, there are different types. So this meme would come from South India, and it relates to practices of Hinduism. Because in Hinduism, the idea is that you start the beginning of the day in a state of ritual purity, and one of the things you can do is get up before your friends at 6.30 in the morning and send them a blessing, a blessing as a meme. By contrast, uh, more familiar maybe for where I work in England is kind of funny memes. I think at the back you can't see that. Um, it says sometimes a mum just needs a five minute rest. Okay. Um, the next one I probably won't read out, but it's typical of the kind of funny memes that Trinidadians um, would post. 
and again, expressing what they see as norm, normal values, the things that it's, you know, what they think about men, for example, all right? So that allows you to have these generalizations that explain what is going on um, with all those means. And the nice thing about these visual forms is there are thousands of, you know, hundreds of that. You, you can look at them all day long and you start to see the generalizations. So I can look at these comparing um, Trinidad and I can say, you know, in Trinidad, people seem to really care what they're wearing and how they look when they post on Facebook. And people in England maybe don't. Um, and that's kind of the difference between them. Um, but also, within my site, I start to see patterns. So, for example, I would not have actually guessed the degree to which the women in this English field site associate with wine. Never any particular kind of wine, just a general thing called wine. And constantly post about their relationship to wine, which then reflects the way that men do the same thing in relation to beer. Similarly, you find endless postings um, about food, but men pretty much only post food that is fattening, and women pretty much post about the problem of food being fattening. Um, and that becomes a pattern. You then start to go back to the points I've made before about the local differences. So you see, for example, English humour tends to be what we call self-deprecating, making fun of yourself. So English love to post, oh, I'm so stupid I put the plug on upside down. Or I'm so stupid I went out, uh, took my kids to school with boots of different colour, etc. Or I just look ridiculous. Um, Whereas Trinidad will not, by and large, post self-deprecating humour. But they will post, for example, in Trinidad you get nationalist postings, whereas in England only the very kind of least educated will tend to post kind of nationalist postings in, in an English context. Um, in Trinidad you get themes like carnival, like bling, like extended families, in a way you wouldn't normally get in an English setting. So let me just give you like one example of that. What happens on social media when you become a mother? Right? Now, if you are in the English field site that I work in, this is what happens. You start off, these are, you probably recognize the series of profile pictures of one individual, right? So here she is, here's the mother. And then her baby is born and you see a few where they're together. And then, after here, she totally disappears. This is not the profile of the baby, it's the profile of the mother. So basically, she replaces herself entirely with the image of her child. She has become a mother in that sense. And that is very typical of the sequences of when you become a mother in England. So, let's move to Trinidad. What happens, what do you post when you become a mother in Trinidad? You post like this. Because what you're saying is, okay, true, I am now a mother. But don't you think for one minute I am less glamorous, less interesting, less out there just because I'm a mother than I was before I was a mother. So, totally different responses to the same transformation. But the nice thing is, because it's so visual, you can study it very, very easily and see these things not ten times or a hundred times, but endlessly, in order to think about the general differences between these places. Okay, so at this point, um, having talked about the specifics, I'm going to get a little bit more academic and talk about some of the general ideas, or if you like, theories, that develop when you do a nine-site comparison of this kind. And I'll give you two or three examples. One of them is we developed this concept which we call polymedia. Now you might think that polymedia just means 
that we have now many more different kinds of media that are available for us to use. And of course, that is true. But actually, we mean something a bit deeper than that. What we mean by the term polymedia is that media itself has become a more social phenomena and a more moral phenomena. And let me explain why. In most of the sites where we work, previously, the reason you take a different media of communication was issues of cost or of access. So the Philippines used vast numbers of texting because it was free or cheap, right? So if that's the reason they use a particular media, then that's also the explanation. You have nothing more to say about it. But today, most people have phone plans or they have internet plans. And it actually doesn't make any difference which of the media they use in terms of cost or access. Now, the result of that is when somebody dumps boyfriend on texting and doesn't give them a phone call, the guy is saying, you dumped me, but couldn't you at least have done it by phone? Did you have to do it just on, on, on a text? In short, you read the media and you read media choices, polymedia, as social and moral evidence in a way that you didn't before. So for us, polymedia is a very important conclusion with respect to how we understand what contemporary media is all about. Okay, second example is that if you're working five years on social media, people are gonna expect you to come up with some definition. What is social media? Now, we don't think there's just one. There are different ones according to your particular interests. But as anthropologists, we came up with this term scalable, scalable sociality. So what does that mean? It means this. It means that, again, if you look at the use of media 30 years ago, 40 years ago, it really divided into two. You either have public broadcasting, like television, radio, newspapers, or you have private, usually one-to-one, -one, like letters, telephone calls, and so forth. Then into that picture, you start to get things like email and web chat that is based more around groups. And then on top of that, you start to get the development of social media. And in general, these go in two directions. So from public broadcasting, you get the development of things like Friendster and MySpace and Facebook, which basically means you're broadcasting, but not to everybody, to a group that has agreed to be on that particular platform with you. So that's one kind of group formation. Then later on, you tend to get the development of things like WeChat, which is hugely important in China, or, or WhatsApp, which is hugely important pretty much everywhere else. Um, and these start from messaging, one-to-one, -to, -one, to gradually develop larger scale groups. By the time all these are in place, what you're getting is a scale. So for any particular form of correspondence, you can choose the degree of privacy or the size of the group that you want to work with. Now, these are things we could do offline before, but we weren't able to do it through the media. So what's happened now is with social media, we've achieved this possibility of scalable sociality. Now, let me give an example of that. I was working in this English field site, and at one time, I did a survey of 2,500 school children, and you could show from the age of 11 to the age of 18, mostly they were using about five different uh, platforms. Um, they used to use like a BBM, BlackBerry Messenger Service, but that has, has generally declined now. now. If you look at those different platforms, you can organize them, because you find that for those school children, um, the smallest one is 
Snapchat, you remember the example I gave of the ugly that is bonding just a few friends together and excluding everyone else. Then you come up to WhatsApp. In, in the class in England, typically you have a WhatsApp group where the girls discuss the boys, a WhatsApp group where the boys discuss the girls, and a WhatsApp group where the girls and boys come together, right? Then you move up to the likes of Twitter, and that was for the whole class. So if a school teacher wants to say something about homework, they would actually put it on Twitter. Facebook used to be there, but Facebook is not cool now for young people. It moves up because that's where your family is. Maybe you're starting work, it's where workers or neighbors or others are there, and you're interacting with them. And at the top, I put Instagram. Because Instagram is the only social media platform where they are happy to have strangers. Why? Because they spent all this time producing this wonderful image, right? They've done the filters, they posted it up there, and somebody from Sweden likes it. And it's like, wow, somebody from Sweden likes my photograph, and that's kind of great, okay? So, if you put that together, you can see the way this creates scalable sociality. Each one finds its kind of ecological niche, if you like, relative to the others. But these are not fixed. They will change over time because it's not a function of the nature of the platform. It's a function of the social usage that is made from that. Which brings me to my next general point. Most of the interest by academics coming out of things like computer science is not surprisingly focused on the technology. So the idea that the particular nature of the platform will help explain why it is used the way it is used. Um, that seemed kind of an obvious thing to say. Um, so there are concepts, I'm sure people on the communication side know, like affordances, which look at the properties of the platform and how you would tend to use them in a particular way. However, that's not what the anthropologists found. What we found was actually that people migrate the same genre of usage from platform to platform. So, I've been talking about the way school kids um, banter, insult each other in the playground, right? So the first place was the playground. Then, because Blackberries were cheap, they started using BBM, Blackberry Messenger Service, for that. Um, then it changes. In some places, that moves to Facebook. In England, it's Twitter. Maybe you heard the term Twitter beef. Um, quarreling over Twitter, right? It's not just presidents that do that. School kids do it too. Um, so, actually, the point is this. If the same genre of social communication happily moves from platform to platform to platform, it cannot be the properties of the platform that explain the usage. It has to be something else. It has to be the things that we are looking at, the social and cultural dynamics that are things like scalable sociality that persuade people to put a platform in this niche at this time and then move it to another niche later on. So that's very different from the conventional way of studying social media. Um, final example. All the three concepts I've just described, polymedia, scalable sociality, and content migration, they are the development of theory based on moving upwards from the empirical evidence. You find your, you have all your field sites, you have all your evidence, you do your analysis, you make your generalizations, you do your comparison, and you come to those kinds of conclusions. But sometimes you need to work the other way, from philosophy downwards. And one of the problems that we feel when we study these new technologies is the general response to them. And to generalize, I would argue there's two main responses to the way people discuss the impact of social media, but also lots of other technologies, on our basic humanity and social lives. One is a kind of nostalgic response. You know, we used to be 
proper human beings. We used to have proper face-to-face -face relations. But now everyone's addicted to their smartphones or staring at their screens or whatever it is and we've kind of lost that essential humanity which apparently we were more human we just stared at, stared at television but I'm not sure why. So either we've lost our humanity but at the same time you'll get a group of scholars who will say wow this new digital, digital technology is amazing you know we're not just ordinary human beings we are now transhuman, we are posthuman, we are cyborgian, right? We're never going to be just human again. Now, the trouble is that every time we come across one of these new technologies, people are making these responses and it's getting a little tedious. Um, and new technologies are going to continue out into the infinite future as far as we know. So here, we would argue the problem is not something to do with our field sites. The problem is at a more philosophical level. It's the problem with what do we mean by the term human. And our argument is that the way people conceptualize the idea of being human is simply too conservative. It's Human is whatever human beings have been up to now. But we would argue that maybe we need a different conceptualization of what it is to be human that includes all the things that human beings are going to be as a result of all the technologies that now are and are going to develop into the future. So yes, Human beings could be defined as things that couldn't fly, then come across airplanes, human beings now can fly. They're still human. Social media allows all sorts of capacities, but they're human beings who are developing through those capacities and changing what they are. Humanity will always change and always has changed because it doesn't exist outside of the material and technological world in which we live. So we call this the theory of attainment because what we're saying is that whatever it is that human beings do it was latent, it was, it was something that was possible but it is only attained as a result of this new technology. So what I've tried to do today is introduce you to all the different sites the kind of empirical material that comes from living in these places for 15 months and then gradually move towards the more abstract, if you like, academic conclusions um, that can be developed on the basis of a project like this. But finally I'm going to talk about one other thing which is people would say, oh, if you can understand social media well in the way you claim then let's see you use it well. Okay, the, what we call the proof is in the pudding. If you, if you know about it, show us. Show us how you can use it. So for us, the challenge was that. We don't want to just say we have observed, we want to say we have learnt, and then we can put it into place. And the way we would do this is through research dissemination. So I started with the idea of anthropologists being holistic, that we study everything that is going on and the way it interacts together. But when we thought about the findings of this research, we come back to this ideal of being holistic. Because we realize that the conventional ways of research dissemination, the books, the journal articles, in some ways that is a little narrow. Actually, everybody's interested in social media. We think we have really interesting things to say about it. But that means you have many different audiences out there who could be interested in those results. So then you think about how to create a range. Just give one example. If you observe that today in many of the sites we work in, education is increasingly in the form of short YouTube videos, that's how people learn, then okay, we produce lots of short YouTube videos um, so they will respond to what we have learnt. But again, it's a spectrum. 
So if you look at our website, why we post, you'll find we do something anthropologists would not normally do. We call it a very simple thing, we call it discoveries. And they are very short with little stories and over a hundred little films. So that this is a, a, and we never use academic language. Um, we have all our work checked by school teachers, so check that we do not use a word that a school child would not understand. So that means that it becomes very accessible. We move from that to um, creating university courses, what's been described to you earlier as the MOOC, um, the, these kind sponsors have agreed to translate into Thai, and the point is that is again very accessible university teaching, again with lots of films, lots of stories, but available for free. Beyond that, however, we want to ensure that people face the substance of what we've studied. Nine times 15 months. So we want thousands of pages of material. So for that, we produced 11 books. They are all published. And again, they are all free. If you go onto why we post and go to, through to UCL Press, you can download any of our books. And we then use social media ourselves and other ways of disseminating it. And just to give a sense of the result of this, traditional anthropology monographs, if you sold 600 or 1,000, you were quite happy. Now, I don't have recent figures, but the figures a few months ago, these books have received, I think, 340,000 book downloads. Okay? For academic books, that's a new world. And not only that, but what's really interesting for anthropologists is where the downloads are. I don't offhand remember the figure for Thailand, but I know there are over 8,000 in the Philippines, I think nearly 5,000 in Indonesia, um, countries we were simply not getting it out in, and we have translated all the books into the languages of the field sites. So basically, we believe we have a responsibility to actually use this for education. People need a better understanding of social media. It's our responsibility that, to make sure they get it. And this is therefore, in a way, that proof that we can use new digital media as well as just study it. Um, so very final slide, because so yeah, I'm over the hour, um, is this. I, this project is finished. It was a five-year project. It's over. We don't intend any further publications out of it. We've done everything we're going to do. I am pleased to say, however, that um, I recently obtained another grant to have another five-year study. And this time, um, instead of nine anthropologists, we have 11 anthropologists. And actually, the field work, all of which will be 16 months, is starting from the beginning of February, the day after I get back from Thailand, as it happens. Um, and again, it's very spread. This time we have a couple of sites in Africa. We again have two sites in China. Perhaps unusually, we have two sites in Ireland. Um, but it's, it's spread around the world. The topic, very briefly, we're moving from social media, I think fairly naturally, to the study of smartphones and the general relationship to smartphones. But we're particularly interested in the fact that these are now migrating to older age groups and we want to look at the impact on this, on what you might call sort of more the, the middle aged, who are just now starting to develop a new world around, around the possibilities of smartphones. Um, but the other thing is we wanted a, a new challenge, something that we hadn't done in the last project, um, to make it more interesting. It, it, it's always more interesting if you can fail miserably, right? So what we said is on this project, we're actually quite interested in what you might call the applied side of this. Um, and what we're looking at specifically is there's a huge sector developing around the use of smartphones for health. Um, first for things like fitness and diet and then increasingly for things like you know, diabetes and, and every kind of health issue. Um, it's, it's happening, there's something like 300,000 apps being developed at the moment, but it tends to be again tech-led. So our idea is to really look from the perspective of the welfare of people, not assume these are necessarily beneficial, not assume anything, but just do what we did in the last project. Sit there, think about it, 
and actually work out if having the anthropology there, having the 15-month studies, we can actually provide better advice, whether it's policy or tech or medical, as to how to improve the health and welfare of the populations in which we will be working. And that is something which maybe I can talk to you about five years from now. Thank you very much. <laughs>